church, if you take uh, your copy of God's Word, uh, turn to Genesis 39. This is a much better chapter than last week's, 38, I promise. It's set beautifully as a contrast to Judah's terrible decision-making. Uh, now we look at his brother, Joseph, his younger brother. What a contrast. And we're going to begin right in the middle of the scene, right at the climax of this moment. And then we're going to, you, you ever watch a movie where, the, where it starts off and then it says, three weeks earlier. We're going to start right at the climax of the scene. Here it is, verse 11. But one day when Joseph went into the house to do his work, remember he's a servant, and none of the men of the house were there in the house. She, that's Potiphar's wife, we don't know her name, but she is the mistress, the maid of the house. She caught him by his garment saying, lie with me. But he left his garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for the clarity of your word and its power to change lives. We pray today, Lord, that you would give courage to speak the words that need to be said, and we pray for conviction that the Holy Spirit would indeed accomplish his work in our hearts. And we ultimately pray, Lord, for change, uh, that as men and women of the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we would act consistently with our character, our calling, and our convictions. So, Lord, have your way today, we pray. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Verse 11 and 12 started with a woman on the prowl and a man on the run. Dwight Eisenhower said this, before a battle, planning is everything. Once the fighting has begun, it's worthless. <laughs> and that's all that. And here we have uh, temptation. Temptation before uh, temptation comes, plans are everything. But when the arrows and the bullets and the traps are set, it is too late. I was thinking about the deer population, which is going to be in significant decline coming shortly. And just think about this. If the deer population could hold a winter workshop called Methods of Deer Hunters, uh, they may be able to learn how to identify and avoid the bait piles. But they don't. I want to start this message uh, before we get into chapter 39 with, uh, with a framework uh, of temptation because uh, no, matter, uh, no matter where we uh, land today, uh, there's a certain framework of understanding temptation that we all face. Uh, first of all, we have the certainty of temptation. Certainty. Uh, we are certain temptation will come. I have a verse to prove that in just a moment. We also have an adversary. How many know that there is an adversary of our soul? Anybody? There's an adversary of our soul. We have the certainty of temptation. We have the adversary of our soul who has a, a part to play. Uh, but apart from the adversary, we also have, uh, frankly, personal vulnerability. Uh, we are all very vulnerable, aren't we, to temptation? Sure, different shades, different colors, different things tempt us all, but there's a vulnerability that we have. Apart from the work of the adversary, there's things in our hearts uh, but then we have this, we have the assurance and the confidence of victory, uh, and the victory is uh, listed in the Word. Now, I want to show you these things in the Scripture. I want to show you the certainty of temptation, their adversary. I want to show you the vulnerability that we have and the victory, if you can put up that slide. Uh, here is the framework to understand before we get into uh, Psalm, or Genesis 39. Uh, here we have on the left-hand side certainty. Here it is. Jesus promised his disciples, temptations to sin are sure to come. <laughs> promise. They're, they're certain to come. And then we have uh, our adversary right there in the middle, Paul, writing to the church of Thessalonica. He says this, I sent to learn about your faith for fear that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. We have an adversary. Uh, apart from him, we have our own vulnerability. Take a look on the right-hand side of the screen there, uh, James chapter 1. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by what? What does it say? 
by his own evil desire. This is the sinful nature. So there's something both, there's an external adversary, but there's also an internal uh, deceiver within us that lures us and tempts us, and it's our own evil desire. But then we have this great verse, probably the, the best verse in the, in the entire Bible on temptation and the victory that we can have through Jesus Christ our Lord. On the very top of the screen, here it is, the Lord reaching down with his grace to pull us up with the victory that we have through his son Jesus. It says this, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful Somebody in Bel Air just said amen. I know they did. God is faithful. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's good. And he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, Joseph, he will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. That is the framework of temptation. No temptation has seized you except that which is common to man. Common. Common amongst us all. It's common with Kanye West. It's common with Donald Trump. It's common with Nancy Pelosi. It's common with Judge Kavanaugh. It's common with you. It's common with everybody, right? Uh, Temptation is common, but God is faithful to give escape. Genesis 39, this chapter, is the premier chapter in the entire Bible about the seduction of temptation, but a remarkable man of character. Joseph points us to the true and better, who is Jesus Christ, the true and better victory over temptation. In chapter 38, Joseph's brother Judah was conquered by his own temptation, by his own lust of the flesh, and he fell into it deep and hard. But here we have his brother who stands firm against the seductive nature of temptation, who stands firm against the adversary, who stands firm against his own vulnerability, and he escapes it with the help of the grace of God. Isn't that good news? Just think what it would be like if if this story turned out like most of the stories in the Bible. Just think about David and Bathsheba, Samson and Delilah, Solomon and all of his wives. Judah and Tamar. Think about all of the stories that went south, but here we have a story of a man who gets it right, and he points us to Jesus Christ, who got it right 100% of the time. Jesus Christ is the true and better victory over temptation. So let's start here. Temptation pursues like a lion. Let's rewind the clock now uh, several weeks earlier before the climax of this scene. You know the story. Joseph was betrayed by his brothers, chapter 37. He was sold. He was presumed dead. At least they lied about him, saying that he must have been torn by animals. He is 17 to 20 years old, roughly. So he's an older teenager. He's a young adult. He is a sterling man. Uh, He he is sold into the home of a slave, of a, a, think of him like a military general. His name is Potiphar. He's an Egyptian. Uh, So he's a high-level commander, and he has a wife named Potiphar's wife. There you go. (laughs) The Scripture does not often give physical traits. Uh, Very rarely does it call attention to anybody's physical traits. Uh, Brown hair, blue eyes, nothing like that. When the Scripture does, it does so for a reason. And so here we have in this narrative, uh, Joseph. uh, Well, let me show you a picture of Joseph. Uh, Here he is. Uh, (laughs) handsome in form and appearance. I think it's verse 8 or 9. It's verse uh, 6, rather. There you go. Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. Now, this is significant because when the Bible calls attention to it, it calls attention to it for a reason. So you get the picture. This is a young man who is handsome in form and appearance. Not only that, but he's also very successful. He comes in as a slave, as a servant to Potiphar, But he has the Midas touch, Uh, Greek mythology. Everything that Midas touches turns to gold. And everything that Joseph touches turns to gold. Five times in five verses. I want you to see how how successful that God made this young man. Uh, Take a look. The Lord was with Joseph. The Lord was with him. The Lord caused all that he did to succeed. The Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. The blessing of the Lord was on all 
that he had. Five times in five verses, God was with him. God was with him. God blessed him. And so here you have a young man who is handsome in form and appearance. He's successful uh, in, in this. In, and then all of a sudden, we have an adversary. How many know that every young man has an adversary? And Joseph has an adversary. It's our same adversary. But this adversary comes disguised. Uh, his Halloween outfit is not scary. He doesn't carry a pitchfork. Uh, this adversary of Joseph comes disguised in the form of an angel of light, and his disguise is in the form of a lioness who is gorgeous and who has incredible power. I went back through the archives of history, and I found, um, uh, believe it or not, they had video back then in Potiphar's day. And uh, we found a video of Potiphar's wife. Uh, here, here's Potiphar's wife. Uh, here she is. Ready? There she is. Uh, Potiphar's wife, the great adversary, is on the prowl. And it's legit. Uh, Joseph is about to face uh, the three big temptations as Potiphar's wife uh, catches the eye of Joseph and she pursues and, and, and she has him in her gaze. Joseph is about to face the three big temptations. You know what they are. The New Testament calls them this, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Maybe it'd be helpful just to go by normal terms, sex, power, and money. The big three. Joseph is about to face all three of these. The lust of the flesh, this woman uh, was everything he desired. The lust of the eyes, she was gorgeous to behold. And the pride of life, she was great in power and wealth. In verse 7, here we have Potiphar's wife. Come to him with great seduction. And her uh, says this, after a time his master's wife cast her eyes on Joseph and said, lie with me. Uh, literally, it's uh, just two simple Hebrew words, uh, very simple, uh, two words. Uh, but here we have in the translation, lie with me. It's, it's a very direct form of appeal. The bait pile is laid, the conditions are right, the tempter has pursued, and the eyes are intrigued. And Joseph, like you with temptation, like me with temptation, Joseph has a choice. The way of the dragon or the way of the lamb. At this moment, men, young men especially, I want you to put yourself in his shoes. He's a young adult, handsome in form and appearance, and he's being pursued by this woman. Put yourself as the main character in the narrative. What would you do? Is that sobering? It takes, the Jews have a word, it, uh, it's chutzpah. Have you ever heard of that word? It takes chutzpah to say no, but he does. I remember hearing a sermon years ago by Chuck Swindoll. I think it was on this passage. It must have been. Chuck Swindoll talks about um, how the appeal to temptation came very simply. Two words. Two words in the Hebrew. And Joseph's response to the temptation comes in the form of 37 Hebrew words or uh, 60 two English words. Look at his rebuttal. Look at how Joseph responds uh, to this seductive, very simple temptation, uh, but look at how he responds in verse 8 and verse 9. But he refused, and he said to his master's wife, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. He is not greater in this house than I am, nor has he kept anything back from me except you because you are his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? You see what he does here? <laughs> Joseph doesn't say, let me pray about it. He doesn't say, hey, let me think about it. Uh, but with chutzpah, uh, Joseph has already learned 
a verse that would come later in the scriptures, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, where Paul says that we must learn to take every thought captive and bring it uh, someplace, bring it to the obedience of Christ. Do you know that verse? There's a man here in our congregation, after he came to know the Lord many, many years ago, that was the first verse he learned, that we must learn to take every thought captive and bring it to the obedience of Jesus Christ. This is what Joseph does. The temptation is offered, two simple words, and he responds and he rebuts against it with such vigor, with such chutzpah. And here's what I believe about this, that as, jo as Joseph acts consistently with his calling, his character, and his convictions, his calling, he's a son of the Most High God, his, 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 uh, his character, uh, he's a man of God, his convictions, this is something that ought not to be done, so he acts consistent with his, with his calling, his character, his convictions. But here's where I think, this is my opinion on this, I think the greatest victory over this temptation was not won in this moment, I believe it was won far before this even occurred. I believe the victory was achieved through his intimacy with God over the weeks and over the months as he abided in Christ, as he abided in the Lord, as he sought God in prayer. I believe that the heart of Joseph was prepared for temptation. I believe that the battle plan, in essence, was set in his heart so that when temptation came, he had the chutzpah to say no. Do you understand what I'm saying? I think the battle plan was there. The abiding was there. The, everything was in place. And so when the temptation came and the adversary was there, here it is, the certainty came. It certainly came to him. The adversary was pulling at him. He had his own sinful nature. He was vulnerable. But with the battle plan in place, God gave him the victory by his grace. I think the victory was won far earlier than this moment. But how many here know that today's victory over temptation does not guarantee tomorrow's success? Do you know that? This woman does not hightail it and run. The tempter revisits him day after day after day. I want you to look at verse 10. And again, imagine, what would you do? <laughs> look at this. And as she spoke to Joseph, day after day, he would not listen to her, to lie beside her, or to be with her. You know, the adversary has our playbook. Do you know that? He's watched our films. He knows our weakness. He relentlessly pursues. He patiently waits. When the adversary tempted Christ, do you remember that in the wilderness? There's a very fascinating verse. After Satan tempted Christ in the wilderness, it said that he left Christ until an opportune time. Did you catch that? He left Christ until an opportune time. He is persistent. He will never give up. He will wear you down. He will beat you up. He will attack when you're weak. But the real battle over temptation is won far before the moment arrives. The victory over temptation comes with intimacy with God, abiding with Christ over the long term, learning to take thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ because we are certain, we are certain temptation will come. We know we have an adversary who prowls against us like a roaring lion. We know we have a sinful nature that needs to be tamed. But we are confident that no temptation has seized us except that which is common to man, but God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but he will provide a way of escape. Isn't that good news? This is what Joseph does. Temptation pursues like a lion, but here we have the way of escape. Here we, we come back to this climactic moment, but one day, but one day, she seized him. Nobody else was around. She caught him by the garment saying, lie with me, but he left 
the garment in her hand and fled and got out of the house. Verse 13, and as soon as she saw that, she, that he had left his garment in her hand and had let, fled out of the house, she called to the men of the household and said to them, see, he has brought among us a Hebrew to laugh at us. He came in to lie with me and I cried out with a loud voice. And as soon as he heard that I lifted up my voice and cried out, he left his garment beside me and fled and got out of the house. In essence, here we go, false narrative. False accusations. This is fascinating. The seductive tempter turns into the vicious accuser. Do you know that if Satan doesn't get his way in one realm, he will move to the other? The tempter moves to the accuser. There's two big issues here. We have the courageous escape. Four times in this passage, it will go on to say, it will repeat, he left and fled and he got out. He left and fled and he got out. He left, he fled, he got out. He left, he fled, and he got out. Intimacy with God taught him to say no. I believe this. It doesn't give us the backdrop, but there's no other way a young man who is handsome in form and appearance with this amount of temptation would have learned to say no apart from the grace of God and abiding in him daily. He had learned to say no. There's a beautiful verse in the book of Titus. Titus chapter 2 says it this way uh, in, in, in how we are taught to learn to say no. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. By the way, what is that grace? Who has appeared? Come on, guys. Jesus. The answer in church is always Jesus whenever you ask. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Jesus, it teaches us to say, help me. No to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled. I'm not a golfer anymore. I used to be. But golfers have a term um, when they hit a ball that just doesn't go where they want it to. And I'm going to take a... Oh, some of you guys know. I'm going to take a mulligan. When you think about this, you think about your own teenage years. How many of you would say with me, man, I wish I could take a mulligan on a few years of my life? Joseph, Joseph, what a man of character. I don't know what I would have done then. I'm scared to think what I would have done then. This guy is awesome. And it points us to Christ, who never needed a mulligan, never. Never. Never once. Joseph did. Joseph had a sinful nature. But this moment points us to Christ, the true and better Joseph, who never needed a mulligan. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 4. I love Hebrews 4, talking about the, the living, resurrected Christ. Here we go. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness. Let me turn that around positive language. We have a high priest who can sympathize with us when we face weakness and temptation. We have one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet has no need of a mulligan. Isn't that awesome? <laughs> he, Christ has been tempted in every way. He can identify with you. He understands that moment. He was tempted in every single way, yet he's without sin. So here is Joseph. He left, he fled, he got out. He left, he fled, he got out. He left, he fled, he got out. Maybe that's why the New Testament authors talk about flee, 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 flee. Look at this. Flee from sexual immorality. Flee from idolatry. As for you, it's not just about uh, idolatry or morality. Here we go. Look at this. As for you, man of God, flee these things. He's talking about the love of money. Somehow we've made materialism and the pursuit of greed appealing in American culture, but the scripture says flee those things. And then 2 Timothy, flee youthful passions. That's a great message for Radiate Ministry. It's a great message for wildfire. Flee, 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 get out. You know, I got to read this testimony. We have a uh, volunteer in our church who's been uh, driving kids back and forth from Kalkaska. He just texted me this. Uh, he says this, hey, Pastor Tree, he knows me well. 
hey, Pastor Tree, I got to share something with you. I've bring been bringing some kids in from Kalkaska to Wildfire. Uh, one kid told me that he had Friday off school and was coming to Traverse City to hang with friends, and I could tell what they may be planning for fun was not good. I told him a story. That very day, I went to court with a kid who grew up in the church, moved away, started hanging with the wrong peeps, moved back to Kalkaska, and I watched as he was sentenced for up to five years in prison for bad choices. The young man I was with got quiet and said his parents just told him how much better his attitude was since he's been coming to Wildfire, how much better he was acting since hanging with Pastor Josh and Wildfire leaders. I told him hanging with Wildfire would, be, would have a great impact on his life, but it wasn't because they were acting good, but because they were living with Christ in their lives, and that's the big difference. Then I told him that he could live, not act like them, if he asked Jesus in his life. So, while traveling down M72 at 55 miles per hour, maybe 60, I took him down the Romans Road, and he prayed and accepted Christ as his Lord and Savior. Pretty cool because of the influence of Pastor Josh, his team, and all the wildfire kids. This teen has an eternal home in heaven with the Lord. I thought you'd like to hear that. Keep on loving Jesus. Is that good news? That's awesome. Flee, flee, flee. Don't make bad choices Friday. Don't, flee, flee, flee. Right? This is it. This is the first big thing, the flee. It's a big issue, courageous escape. But then we have the irony here. The irony of the false accusation. <laughs> the irony that Joseph's coat, remember that coat from chapter 37? The multicolored one, which was used as evidence, false evidence, that he was dead. His coat gets him in trouble again. A different coat, of course. But the story turns into a he said, she said, false accusations of sexual misconduct. Does this sound familiar? Imagine how Joseph must have felt. No words of Joseph are in this passage. No words. But imagine, other than his resisting the temptation. How did he respond to the false accusations? We don't know. But no words. But imagine how it cut to his heart. False accusations. There was an article in the Wall Street Journal a um, week ago, maybe two weeks ago now. Fascinating article written by an attorney about how false accusations uh, really have an effect on a person's life. Look at this. Those falsely accused of misconduct faced a hellish choice. Let it go and allow the lie to persist as a permanent blot or fight back. They lament the unfairness of having their reputation destroyed. They slowly realize there is no easy fix. They grieve over the damage to their families. They worry about who has seen the defamation. The stress, they stress out, wondering if they'll ever be able to go to a social gathering without encountering someone who thinks it's true. They get angry. They cry. For most, it's their darkest hour. Joseph, right here is at his darkest hour. Falsely accused of attempted rape, sent to prison for a crime he didn't commit, his reputation forever labeled as a sex offender. Is that fair? Not even close to fair. Is God still in charge? Absolutely. And it points us to the true and better Joseph, Jesus Christ, who also experienced what? Think of it. He experienced false accusation, criminal labels. He experienced a coat that was ripped off him. He was mocked with false testimony. He paid the punishment for a crime that he didn't do. And how did Jesus respond to all of it? Like Joseph, without a word. Peter writes this, 1 Peter chapter 2. For this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrow while suffering unjustly. There it is, suffering unjustly. You get it? Suffering unjustly. That's Joseph and that's Jesus. For to this you have been called, you, church, New Hope, you've been called to this because Christ also suffered for you, leaving an example for you so that you might follow in his steps. He committed, help me, what? No sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. Here it is. But continued entrusting himself to him, the Father, who judges justly. That's what Joseph does. 
behind the injustice, the false accusations, the defamation, behind all of that, we have the privilege of hindsight, don't we? God was repositioning Joseph to a position of power in Pharaoh's household. God was at work. God was at work. And when Christ was laid in the tomb, God was repositioning the Son of God to raise in power and exaltation at the resurrection. This is the good news of the gospel, that when temptation pursues, God provides a way of escape. And God's fear, God's, I'm sorry, God's favor is seen. God's favor is seen. Eventually, eventually, look at this last part. Verse 19, here we go. As soon as his master heard, okay, now Potiphar hears, as soon as his master heard the words that his wife spoke to him, false accusations, this is the way your servant treated me, she says. His anger was kindled, and Joseph's master took him and put him in the prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him steadfast love and great, gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison put Joseph in charge of all the prisoners who were in the prison. Whatever was done there, he was the one who did it. The keeper of the prison paid no attention to anything that was in Joseph's charge because, why? Because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made it succeed. God's favor is seen eventually, isn't it? Now, let's not sugarcoat this. He was betrayed and sold by his brothers. He was unfairly accused. He was unjustly imprisoned. He was soiled in his reputation. He was put under the keeper in a jail cell. But Joseph knows something. Joseph knows something, that God is still in charge. God is still in charge. God is just repositioning the framework and the elements, and God is doing his thing. And it would take 13 years, but God's favor would be seen eventually. As God was with him, as God improved him, as God promoted him, God was doing something. One of my daughters gave me a birthday present. Do we have that slide? I think we do. She gave me a birthday present. She drew this for me. Jesus replied, you don't understand what I'm doing now, but someday you will. It's Jesus' words out of John 13. My daughter gave that to me at a time in life uh, this year when I really didn't know what God was doing. And And it was just such a beautiful reminder You do not understand what is going on, but someday you will. I wonder if Joseph could have used that verse. (laughs) Joseph, you've been put under the keeper of the prison. You don't understand what's going on, but someday when you're 30 years old and Pharaoh has a dream that he needs interpreted, guess what? God's going to raise you up. You don't understand what's going on? Someday you will. He was put under guard of the keeper. (laughs) Joseph knew this. There's a true and better keeper. His name is Jehovah. Psalm 121, the Lord is your keeper. He will keep you from all evil. He will keep your life. He will keep your going out and your coming in from this time forth and forevermore. Here is Joseph under the keeper's watch, and yet he looked and he turned his eyes to the true and better keeper over all, the one who keeps your life the one who keeps you from falling. The Lord was with him, and the Lord is with you. What do we do with this? Let me go back to this and we're done. Action steps, here it is. Temptation. Everybody say certainty. You know it's coming. You gotta have a battle plan. What do you do when temptation comes? You gotta learn to take thoughts captive, bring them to the obedience of Christ. You have an adversary of your soul. Everybody say adversary. First Peter chapter 5, the devil, your adversary, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Resist him firm in the faith. Vulnerability. Galatians chapter 6 verse 1, 
Keep watch on yourselves, lest you be tempted. Keep watch on yourselves. You can't always say the devil made me do it. Sometimes you've just been stupid, right? And then Satan plays the guilt and the shame card. But sometimes it's just plain old you and me acting out our sinful nature. Keep watch on yourselves, lest you be tempted. Victory. The Lord taught us to pray. Lead us not into temptation. You, you realize that? He taught us to pray, Lord, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We are prone to wander. Let's bow our heads. Uh, you pray. Uh, Lord, I pray now that your spirit would do your work. Uh, Lord, uh, trusting that uh, you've given me the courage, Lord, to speak what needs to be said, but now, Lord, we are praying for your spirit to bring conviction where conviction needs to be done. Uh, Father, as men of God, women of God, young men, young women of God, we pray that we would act consistently like Joseph, uh, consistent with our character, consistent with our convictions, consistent with our calling. But in all of this, Father, we know that we have fallen, we have failed, and so we lift our eyes and our gaze to Christ, the grace of God who has appeared and who extends forgiveness and grace because you alone, O oh Lord, our Savior, is the only one who has never sinned yet tempted in every way. We thank you that Hebrews says that you are able to help those who are being tempted, and we pray for your help now. Whatever temptation comes our way, and we are certain they will come, we pray you would help us to stand firm, resist the devil, and he will flee.